Well, finally, out of the Gospel of John and into the Gospel of Mark, where we have a wonderful reading about where evil comes from. And where does it come from? Right here. We all have within us the power to be wickedly evil people. Now, is that good news? Not really, but we'll get to the good news here. But first, the story from a treasury of Jewish folklore, stories, traditions, legends, humor, wisdom, and folk songs of the Jewish people. A young man once came to a great rabbi and asked him to make him a rabbi. It was wintertime then, and the rabbi stood at the window looking out upon the yard while the rabbinical candidate was droning into his ears a glowing account of his piety and learning. The young man said, You see, Rabbi, I always go dressed in spotless white like the sages of old. I never drink any alcoholic beverages. Only water ever passes my lips. Also, I live a plain and simple life. I have sharp-edged nails inside my shoes to mortify me. Even in the coldest weather, I lie naked in the snow to torment my flesh. And daily I receive forty lashes on my bare back to complete my perpetual penance. And as the young man spoke, a white horse was led into the yard and to the water trough. It drank, and then it rolled in the snow, as horses sometimes do. Just look, cried the rabbi. That animal, too, is dressed in all white. It also drinks nothing but water. It has nails in its shoes and rolls naked in the snow. Also, rest assured, it gets its daily ration of forty lashes on the rump from its master. Now I ask you, is it a saint or a horse? See, sometimes we do things because that's what we think we're supposed to do. We're supposed to follow these traditions and do the things that we've been taught. Right? That's exactly what the Pharisees are talking about here. Now, don't get me wrong. Tradition is good. And there's a difference between tradition, being tradition, holding to our tradition, and being traditional. The difference is, tradition holding to our tradition is building upon something that we have that's meaningful and leads us to a deeper understanding in our faith and leads us to be deeper disciples of Christ. And being traditional is doing something because that's the way we've always done it and that's what we've always been taught. It does nothing to edify our faith, but that's just the way we've always done it. See the difference? One builds up faith. One is just something we do because that's what we're supposed to do so that people see us doing the things we're supposed to do. Which is what Jesus talks to the Pharisees this morning about, right? In our reading, Jesus is there with his disciples and they're eating with defiled hands, meaning they didn't ceremonially wash their hands before they sat down to eat. They didn't do what was prescribed to them in the law, as the Pharisees did. And and Jesus quotes to them Isaiah, right was the prophet when he wrote, you're basically whitewashed tombs giving me lip service. Right? Where we say one thing, but we do something different. Where we might do one thing so people can see us doing it, but when nobody's looking, we do something else. Because Jesus says it's nothing outside, and I think it's interesting, we didn't have it in our actual reading, but there's, when I said, thus making all food clean this morning, when I read that part of the scripture, that's in parentheses, meaning that it probably wasn't actually there, that it's an editorial thing that was added in later. And even that, Jesus didn't make all food clean. But he said it's not what we eat or what comes into us that defiles us. Right? We have within us the innate power to do everything wrong, that we could ever possibly do. Because that's who we are as human nature, right? We are creatures that will look out for who? Who do we look out for? The unholy trinity, I like to call it. Me, myself, and I, right? We look out for ourselves. Given, given our true nature and following after what we would look for in our own hearts and our own desires, we look out for ourselves and not for the other. That's not what God calls us to do, though. It's not about just doing things because that makes us look good in the eyes of others. It's not about just being places because that makes us look good in the eyes of others. This morning on the take-home sheet, one of the questions I asked is, why are you here? Why do you come to worship on Sunday? I hope it's not because of me. I, I honestly mean that. I hope it's because you hear through the services that we have a word of God speaking to you and that God is calling you here each and every Sunday morning. 
to learn, to be edified, to become deeper disciples of Christ. But why are we here? I had a conversation on Thursday with a young lady who is a youth worker in our Senate who's discerning whether or not she should go to lay school in our Senate or go do youth ministry certification school at one of the locations where they offer it. And we were talking about different things. And towards the end of our conversation, we got to the point where she visited this church and the pastor was talking about stewardship. And he said, I'm going to say it to you plain this morning. When we pass the plates later and you look in your wallet to see how much you have and you put a $5 bill in the plate and then you go spend $50 for lunch later, who are you actually giving lip service to? And that's a hard thing to hear. And trust me, it's not an easy thing for me to say to you, even though it's not my story, it's somebody else's story. Why are we here? And why do we do the things that we do? Jesus talked about the, the, the prophet this morning saying about the Pharisees that your hearts are not close to me. Right? It's about a religion. And James tells us, as Kurt read for us this morning, that a religion that God wants is that you care for the orphan. You look out for the widow. You look out for the oppressed. You look out for those who are in need. Right? Jesus came not to uphold the religious order of the time, but to give them a new understanding of who God was and how God wanted them to live. The question is, where is your heart? After we get done with worship here this morning, we're going to have a meeting about what's happening here in this place. And there's a lot of stuff going on right now. In the world, there's a lot of hatred happening in our country. There's a lot of things that could really just pull us down. But I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is working in and through this place because I see it in the eyes and in the faces and in the things that, that you do. I could take the next half hour to talk about people I see here this morning and the things that I know that you do. And the things that I know that you do, not because it's something going to give you something. It's something that God has worked in and through you. Because you see the mission that God has set before you. And you walk in that path. So how can we continue to do that? Make sure our hearts are in the right place. Make sure our lives are centered on Christ. And make sure that we're not just doing things because we want others to see us. Because in each and every one of us, there is a huge sinner... But thanks be to God that Jesus Christ entered this world and did what he did for each and every one of us so that we can also be saints at the same time. That is the only thing from without of us that can come into us and make us any different than we already are. And that is Jesus Christ who died on the cross so that you could be with God. It's nothing that you can do. So there's no reason to do anything Yes, I did actually just say that. There's no reason for you to do anything. Because God has already saved you. But James also goes on to tell us that faith without works is dead. So the fact that God has saved you moves you to do things. As I was preparing for this morning, I was looking at a bunch of different things, and I came across this one question that I just had to ask you. Because it always makes me wonder. And we talk, and we're getting ready to start confirmation, and how we have kids who are here for confirmation, and then after confirmation, what happens? They go away until they turn 25, 30, and they have kids, and they want to bring their kids back, right? It happens. It's truth. We can talk about it. It's okay. We have rare instances where they don't. You know, I see a few faces in the crowd. So, thankfully, somebody's getting it. But, the question is, does making children go to church and Sunday school give them the proper faith? Or does living with such strict rules turn them away from a proper understanding of God's grace? Let me read that again. Does making children go to church and Sunday school give them the proper faith? Or, does living with such strict rules turn them away from the proper understanding of God's grace? The answer to that question is yes. It's both and. 
We can make our kids come to church as much as we want. We can make them sit in Sunday school. And yes, they're going to learn something. But are they going to understand what faith is? Maybe, maybe not. If we don't make them come to church, are they going to understand God's graciousness? Yes. Will they understand what faith is? Maybe, maybe not. See, it's our lives as followers of Christ have to show something beyond just the things that we do that gets people's attention. It's where is our heart at? Why do you do the things that you do? Is it because we're following Jesus Christ and doing the things that He asked us to do? Or is it because we want the notoriety for the things that are laid out before us? It's not an easy thing to think about. It's not an easy thing for me to stand in front of you and say. But that's the gospel this morning. It's where is our hearts at and what are we doing? Are we like the Pharisees and being whitewashed tombs? Are we like those who just do things so that others can see them? Or are we truly led and following after Christ? Matthew tells us that where our treasure is, our heart will be also. We always want to turn that around and say our, where our heart is, our treasure will be there too. That's, we have to get our heart right in order for us to give our treasure and time to God. But it's backwards. When you give your time and your treasure to God, guess what's going to follow your heart. It's easier to learn to walk a new way than it is to walk in a new way. Does that make sense? It's easier to learn to walk a new way than it is to just step up and do something completely different than you've ever done. You have to teach yourself how to do that. And if any of you are bold enough, I can tell you exactly where your heart is if you'll show me one thing. Your checkbook. I guarantee you I can show you where your heart is. I'm not asking you to. Please don't. (laughs) But if any of you want to see mine, I'll gladly let you look through it. Because we have to set ourselves as an example to the world around us and do things not because that's what we're supposed to do, but do things that's because what God led us to do. And if we can continue to do that, as I've already said, I know that we're doing that. If we can continue to walk in that way and walk in the path that God has set before us, then we will be a beacon on a hill and some, a, an outpost to draw people to God, to show them exactly what He's doing in this world. So stay focused on God and follow after Him. And do the things that you're led to do, not because you're going to get anything in return, because you've already been given the greatest gift you could ever possibly have. A life with God forever. But do those things so that others will see that and be drawn to come to find out what it is that you have.